fed up with the everyday grind, tired out by the dull routine. You want to get away from it all. We offer you Escape. Escape, transcribed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You're aboard the Orient Express, rushing through the European night bound for Istanbul. And in your compartment with you, a gun pointed at your head, a small, mysterious stranger is about to take your life. Today, we escape from reality to the tense world of Balkan intrigue, as Graham Greene pictured it in his famous novel, Orient Express. My name is Gregory Myatt. In 1932, I had to go to Istanbul on business, and I decided to take the Orient Express. After an uneventful trip across the channel, I found myself at the station in Austin, Belgium, where the Orient Express began. The porter took my bags and overcoat to my first-class compartment while I lingered on the platform. And, inevitably, somebody bumped into me. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Oh, that's quite all right. I wonder which way are the second-class coaches, please? That way, I think. Uh, your suitcase looks heavy. May I? Oh, no, thanks. I can manage all right. Yeah, she had a very nice figure, trim and erect. I wondered whether she was going as far as Istanbul. Orient Express, on what do you... On what do you... I made my way down the platform to my coach. But there was a stranger in my compartment going through my overcoat. Young man, you have the wrong compartment. And you have the wrong overcoat. This coat is mine. Also, this compartment, number seven. It happens to be number eight. Eight? I have made a mistake. A thousand apologies, sir. Oh, <laughs> well, that's all right. Well, thank you. You are going to Belgrade, perhaps? No, no, I'm for Istanbul. So, allow me. My name is Richard John. How do you do? My name's Myatt, Gregory Myatt. I am grateful you are a fellow countryman. These little mistakes can be so difficult to explain. Fellow countryman? But I'm American. I also... I am a naturalized American all these many years, but the accent remains. Hmm? Yes, I suppose it does. Well, we are underway. I will go to my compartment. A most pleasant journey, sir, and again, a thousand apologies. I looked at the landscape for a while and then got out a book and settled down to read. And at that moment, of course, we ran into a string of tunnels, all of them pitch black. I was just about to ring for the guard to ask to have the lights switched on, but the train was crashing to a stop. We were in a tunnel. I got up and groped for the door. Went into the corridor just as the lights went on. And lying on the floor was the girl who had bumped into me. Excuse me, please. One side, please. Excuse me, please. Madame is conductor. It is my duty to inform you it is not allowed for a passenger to stop the Orient Express. Mr. Myatt, if you will allow me, please. Oh, Mr. John. Hadn't we better get a doctor? I am a doctor, Mr. Myatt. Allow me. So, there is nothing wrong with this young lady. She has only fainted. Oh, good, good. Uh, give me a hand, Mr. John. Let's get her in my compartment. Yes, of course you are. Here you are. Drink this. It's brandy. Drink it, young lady. It will help you. Good. I don't know why I think it. I never did before. When did you last have a decent meal? Yesterday? The day before? I suppose it was the day before. That's my affair. You have no money? No. Uh, how would you like to have dinner with me? Well, I... Uh, please say yes. I won't say no. Fine, fine. Will you join us, Mr. John? No, I, I prefer to remain in my compartment. As we dined, I learned her name was Carol Musker. She was a chorus girl, and she had a job waiting for her in Istanbul. I felt a bit sorry for her, but, well, more than that, I, I remembered how she felt in my arms when I carried her into my compartment. And I wanted to hold her again. I ate a lot, Mr. Myatt. I hope you can afford the check. <laughs> I think I can. Oh, good. 
Now, how about uh, breakfast tomorrow? And all the rest of your meals till we reach Istanbul. Mr. Myatt, I hope you don't have any ideas about me. Well, of course I have. You're very attractive. Well, I, I don't know anything about you. For all I know, you're married and have six children. I am not, and I haven't. <laughs> How about you? I have no one. Well, then there's no reason why we shouldn't have ideas about each other, is there? And by the way, my first name's Gregory. Uh, more coffee or dessert? No, thanks. Well, then as soon as I've well, paid Mr. the... Mr. Myatt. Oh, Mr. John. Excuse me, hey. is this yours? I... That's my pocketbook. I found it in the corridor outside my compartment. You must have dropped it when you lifted this young lady. He gave me my pocketbook and left the dining car. All my money was there, but one thing I knew, I had not dropped my pocketbook. Mr. John had taken it. Well, Carol and I started through the train. It was about nine o'clock and the lights were already dimmed. In the second-class coaches, people were asleep, sitting up in the crowded compartments. Mr. Myatt, here's my compartment. Thank you for dinner. It's, uh, very early. You have to go in? Oh, I'm tired. Oh, it's too crowded in there for comfortable sleeping. And besides, you never know who's next to you. <laughs> oh, but I do. That little fat man, see? His name's Joseph Grunlich. <laughs> he introduced himself. Oh, he did, did he? You're not jealous. No. But what do you know about him? He might be a thief or a bigger... <laughs> now or... you're being ridiculous. Well, good night, Mr. Myatt. Gregory. Carol. Yes? You might kiss me goodnight. No one will notice. All right. Well, oh. oh, young love out there. Oh, oh Mr. Grumley. If you are going somewhere, sir, why don't you go ahead? Do not be angry, please. I was not spying, Mr. Meyer. How do you know my name? We all heard of the gentleman gallant enough to take Miss Muscat to dinner at the good doctor's suggestion. Doctor? What doctor? Mr. John. He's a doctor, is he not? <laughs> now, if you'll please excuse me, I must get some water. I'm quite thirsty. I don't think I like that guy. Carol, how about taking my compartment? Your compartment? <laughs> or I'll, I'll get you another one. We'll speak to the conductor right now, huh? Uh, first class compartment for the young lady, monsieur. You must wait until I arrive at Cologne. No tickets are sold aboard the Orient Express. We arrive in Cologne in, uh, let me see, uh, precisely 15 minutes. As we walked up to the first class ticket window, a woman elbowed us out of the way. Please, please excuse me. You don't mind if I go first, do you? My train for Paris leaves any minute. Well, in that case, go right ahead. Thank you. Oh, Hans. Oh, oh, Fräulein One to Paris, Hans. My editor has got me... She was a reporter, apparently. While waiting for her change, her eyes went past me to the Orient Express, and suddenly they widened. I followed her glance. Mr. John was just stepping back into his compartment. Uh, one moment, Hans. Change this ticket for a sleeper on the Orient Express. Make it uh, Belgrade. You, you are lucky, Miss Warren. There is only one accommodation on the Orient Express. Oh, good, uh, good. Just a moment there. We were here first. Uh, I thought you were going to Paris. Not Miss. when I see Dr. Zinner on the Orient Express. Dr. Zinner? Uh, the man you were looking at was uh, Richard John. Is that the name he's using now? Oh, uh, Fräulein? Thank you, Hans. Uh, j just a moment there. I'm taking that ticket. My dear, I regret. But the lady asked for it before you did, and she is an old customer. Uh, here. Here's the ticket, Miss Warren. Who is it? Gregory Might, Mr. John. I'd like to talk to you for a moment. May we come in? Why, yes. Yes, of course. You are feeling better, Miss Musker? You are getting enough rest? Yes, thanks. That's why we're here. Miss Musker is taking my compartment, and I'm staying in here with you. I wish I could oblige, but I prefer my privacy. Why is that, Dr. Zinner? My name is Richard John. Where did you hear otherwise? From a newspaper reporter who saw you in the station at Cologne. Oh. I don't know what it's all about, and I don't much care, but Miss Musker is going to have my compartment, and I'm going to move into this one with you. Any objections? No. In fact, both of you shall stay here with me. But... 
What's the devil? Gent me, Mr. Myers. Yes, a gun. I am an excellent shot, believe me. We shall all stay. I insist. Lock the door, Mr. Myers. That's fine. Now, just who are you, Mr. Myers? Who am I? A police spy here to keep me from getting to Belgrade? Well, that's ridiculous. You surely don't expect me to believe your story about some... Mr. John. Mr. John. That sounds like the reporter from Cologne. Tell her she has made a mistake. Tell her, Myers. Uh, go away. You've got the wrong compartment. My name is Myers. I'm a reporter. Mabel Warren, London Clarion. Myers, put your arm around Miss Musker. Open the door part way, just enough for her to see both of you. I shall be behind the door. And remember, I have a gun. I... Oh, you're not the man I'm after, are you? My name is Myatt. I haven't the slightest idea where you can find your Mr. John. Well, I'll find him. He's on the Orient Express somewhere. Excuse me for interrupting your, uh... Um... Uh, excuse me for interrupting you. Good night, Mr. Myers. Bolt the door, please. Oh, perhaps you really are only an American businessman, Mr. Myers. In that case, I owe you an explanation. Sit down. He told us a fantastic story. He was a political exile from his own country. He'd been forced to leave five years ago, and now he was going back to lead a rebellion to overthrow the government by a coup d'etat. And to me, it made very little sense. Had it not been for the gun in his hand, I might have laughed so in see, his face. If I am captured before this train gets to Belgrade, I will be executed. Once in Belgrade, however, I am safe. I am very popular. I know the city. There are thousands ready to hide me. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, now that you believe we're who we say we are, you could put that gun away. I'll bunk here with you, and Miss Muska can go to my compartment. I cannot allow that. Among the passengers on this train are many of my countrymen. Some would be loyal if they knew about me, but others would not. Dr. Zilla, we'll tell no one. I am sure you would not, intentionally, but it might slip out. No, I cannot permit you to leave this compartment. I'm warning you, if I can, I'm going to take that gun away from you. Don't try it, my friend. You're older than I am, Dr. Zilla. You're tired. Just how long can you stay awake? I sat with Carol on one seat. He was across from us, the revolver in his hand. And it got later and later and later. I'm tired, Greg. Now just close your eyes then, Carol. Are you sleepy, Dr. Zinnan? Not yet, Mr. Meyer. Carol was asleep on my shoulder. I fought to keep my eyes open, but I dozed off. And then somehow I came awake. I lifted my head. Dr. Zinner was asleep. I reached across and grabbed the gun. Oh, oh. Greg. It's all right, Carol. I've got it. Well, Dr. Zinner? <laughs> you are right, sir. I tried to stay awake. But... Stay here, Carol. I'm going to locate the conductor. I'm going to tell him what's been going on. Oh, no, you must not. I shall never get to Belgrade. Greg, don't kill him. No. We're still outside his country. He won't be hurt. But if you report me to the conductor, I shall be put off the train. Well, in short, no harm done. I'll be back soon, Carol. I left the compartment and started down the corridor. I heard a noise behind me, and as I turned, I caught a glimpse of a shadowy figure, one arm raised high above my head. And then the arm swung down, and something hard and heavy crashed against my skull. And I fell into a pool of blackness, and I knew nothing more. In just a moment, we will return to Escape. But first... The blazing billboard for CBS's ten great Sunday night shows has an especially big blaze of lights near the top of the list. That's where the names of Spike Jones, Jack Benny, and Amos and Andy are found in succession. Spike Jones, Jack Benny, Amos and Andy, the most unusual sequence of top-rating comedy in radio. Don't miss a single second of their 90 non-stop minutes of mirth tomorrow night on CBS's great Sunday night ten. Amos and Andy and Spike Jones come to you over most of these same CBS stations, and Jack Benny is heard over them all. 
And now, with our star, Bill Conrad, we return to the second act of Escape and... The Orient Express. How much later it was when I opened my eyes, I don't know. Whoever had hit me had done an expert job. Might have been Zena or... Or even Carol. Had no way of knowing. The gun was gone. I dragged myself to my feet and stumbled down the corridor back to compartment number seven, but it was empty. Perhaps they'd moved to my compartment. I hurried to it. No, no, there was nothing in my compartment. My bags were gone, even my overcoat. Inside, I began to feel a strange, unreasoning fear. Why was it so quiet? Where were all the other passengers? I went along the entire corridor. I opened every door in the coach. Uh, the com- it was completely empty. I felt as, as if I were going crazy. And I lost consciousness again. Here. Here you. Huh? Mister. Huh? Wake up. Wake up. Huh? Who are you? I, sir. I am the brakeman. No. Tell me, what happened to everyone? This coach was full. I got on at Austin. Dozens of people got on at Austin. Oh, no, sir. This coach is empty. And it comes only from Regensburg. Regensburg? Uh-huh. No, it's, it's from Austin, I tell you. Look, compartment eight. This was mine. My bags, my overcoat, they were here, and now they've disappeared. <laughs> yeah, what was that? Oh, that is only the switch engine. We're on the yards outside Vienna. This coach is a deadhead. It was put on at the Orient Express at Regensburg, and now we take it off. Deadhead? You mean... No, it's not my coach at all. The regular coach is... The Orient Express is in front of us, sir. If you do not want it to leave without you, you had better hurry, sir. Don't worry, I'll make it. The Orient Express was just getting underway when I dropped off the front of the deadhead. I had plenty of time to run up alongside and swing aboard. I made my way through the train to my coach and knocked on the door of Senna's compartment. Open up in there. Who is this? Gregory Myatt, open the door. Come in, please. Lying on the berth, bound and gagged, was the reporter, Miss Warren. And standing beside her, gun in hand, was not Dr. Zinna, but Joseph Grunlich. You have a very tough skull, Mr. Myatt. I should have hit you a little harder, no? Where is Carol? Where is Dr. Zinner? Why have you tied up this reporter? No, please, please. Not so fast. First, as to Miss Warren, I have tied her to prevent her from interfering with Dr. Zinner. Had I allowed her to file her newspaper story, Dr. Zinner would never get to Belgrade. I happen to be a Narden follower of Dr. Zinner. I was standing watch last night when you dashed into the corridor, Mr. Myatt. You had this very gun in your hand. You had obviously broken away from Dr. Zinner. Fortunately, I had a blackjack. Where is Carol and Dr. Zinner? Do you promise to do nothing to interfere with Dr. Zinner's plan? I promise nothing. Now, be reasonable. The Orient Express will soon cross the border into my own country. It makes only one stop at the border for passport identification. After that, you are involved no longer. Why be stubborn? All right, Grunlisch. I won't interfere. Oh, Mr. Myatt, I thank you. You may go now. Dr. Zinner and Miss Muscar are next door in your compartment. Dr. Zinner was seated on one berth dozing, and Carol lay on the opposite berth fast asleep. Traces of tears on her cheeks. She shivered. I covered her with my overcoat, and she woke up. Gregory. Gregory, I didn't know where you were. Go back to sleep. Oh, I searched everywhere. I didn't know what to do. And I came back here. Oh, you were so tired. Dr. Zinner made me go to sleep. Everything's all right. In a few hours, everything will be fine. Now, close your eyes and go back to sleep. I left the compartment and went to the second-class coach. With both Carol and Grundlich gone, there was space for me. I slept until I was awakened by a Hungarian passport inspector. The train had stopped in a town named Subotica, just inside the border. I showed him my passport, and I went to the dining car. 
The breakfast rush was just starting, so I gave a waiter a pound note and had him get me breakfast for two. By the time the Orient Express was ten minutes out of Shibotica, we were going down the corridor. The loaded tray tinkling as the waiter followed me. We arrived at my compartment, but it was empty. No sign of Senna, no sign of Carol. A torn piece of paper was tucked under the cuff of my overcoat. It was a note. I have left with Dr. Zinna. I'm afraid this is goodbye. Signed, Carol Musker. Sir, the breakfast. Where shall I put the tray? What? The breakfast. Oh. Take it back. I don't want it. I sat near the window and watched the landscape drift past. My suspicions had been right all along. Dr. Zinner had played me for a fool. And so had Carol. After a while, I became conscious of a tapping sound on the wall of my compartment. It kept on, and suddenly I realized that it was coming from the compartment next to mine, someone's heel banging against the wall. It took only a minute to get next door. It was Miss Warren, the reporter, all tied and gagged. Oh, thank goodness. I thought you'd never hear me. Where's Grudlick? Where are the others? You mean you don't know what's happened? Then it's going to be executed. Executed? Well, they took him off the train at Subotica. Grudlick arranged the whole thing. He's a government spy. Well, it can't be. Well, he is. They're probably holding a drumhead court-martial on Dr. Zinner back in Subotica this minute. I see. And Carol Musker's a government spy, too? The girl? No. Yes, she must be. They took her off the train. Well, they had to. They couldn't have any witnesses. Well, what will they do with her? Probably kill her. But... Hey, here, what are you doing? You can't jump off. The train's going 60 at least. I'm going back there. To the Buddha? You're insane. Look, there's a small town up ahead. I saw it when I leaned out. Some cars are parked at the station. I saw them. I'm going to pull the emergency cord. Take one of those cars. What can you possibly do in Sabotica? I don't know, but I'll do something. Go ahead, Mr. Myers. I'm going with you. I pulled the emergency cord, and in a matter of seconds, the Orient Express was screeching to a halt right at the station. I flung open the door, and with Miss Warren close behind me, I ran toward the parked cars. Here. You. You. Come here. Do you speak English? A car, gentlemen, a car very cheap. I want to go to Shibotica. He's too far, 50 kilometers. I'll give you 20 pounds. Well, get in, gentlemen, get in. We were at Shibotica inside of an hour. I had the driver stop just before we got into the center of town and told him to wait. Miss Warren and I started down the main street. Mr. Myers. In the doorway of a small restaurant, his back to us, talking to a chef, was Joseph Grundlich. Just keep walking. All right. Try to hear what he's saying. Yeah. Did you hear what he said? Something about a last meal for two people to be taken to the railroad station. Don't turn your head. Just keep walking. Yeah. The railroad station platform was empty, so was the ticket office. But through the window, we could see the waiting room, and beyond it was a closed door to a baggage room. There was a large, old-fashioned key in the lock, and standing beside the door was a soldier with a rifle. <laughs> That's where they must be in the baggage room. You don't have a gun, I suppose? No. No, neither do I. The key's in the lock. If I can get to it without the soldiers noticing. We've got to get the soldier away from the door, Miss Warren. How? Uh, Look, do you see that telephone over there in the far no, corner? No. If we could somehow get the soldier over to the telephone, his view of the baggage room door would be cut off. Yeah. Look, that'll be your job, Miss Warren. Fine. Go into the waiting room and up to the telephone booth. Smile at the soldier as you go by. Then pretend you're having some trouble with the phone. Appeal to him for help. Right. When he joins you at the phone booth, keep him occupied while I go in and let him out. But he might look around. Just talk to him. Senator and Carol and I will try to make the car. You'll have to hurry. We look in that last meal may be here any minute. We'll hurry, all right. Through the grimy window, I watched as Miss Warren crossed the waiting room to the telephone, smiling at the soldier. She left the booth and walked over to him. Couldn't hear what they were saying. She smiled at him again, putting her hand on his arm. They went over to the booth. I took a deep breath and entered the waiting room. I could hear them talking as I started toward the baggage room. Oh, yes. Carol. That's the number. Oh, here, I have it right here in my... Carol. Gregory. Shh, shh. No noise. Dr. Zinner, Carol, go to the station platform. Now, no noise. Come on. All right, follow me. Oh, no, but I heard about... I didn't know. 
We started back toward the open door that led to the station platform. We went out slowly, not making a sound. Miss Warren was still talking to the soldier, and then suddenly their voices stopped. I glanced back. The soldier's gun had fallen to the floor. He was kissing Miss Warren. We got out to the platform, and I shut the door quietly. All right, follow me. The car's two blocks away. What about well, her? She's a reporter. They won't dare touch her. Now, come on. All right. In a few moments, the station was behind us. The car was only a block away now. We turned the corner, and walking toward us, about ten feet away, was Joseph Grundlich and a waiter from the restaurant. Before he could collect his wits, I ran at him. <laughs> he crumpled to the ground, then I hit the waiter. All right, run for it! All right. Grundlich fired a few shots at us, but hit no... And then we were in the car, and he fired at us no longer. Goodbye, Dr. Zinner. You sure you won't come along? No, I stay here in Belgrade. I shall be all right now, thanks to you. Goodbye, Mr. Meyer. Goodbye. Come in. Hello. Hello. You, uh... Mind if I sit down? No, not at all. Well, we'll be in Istanbul tomorrow. Mm Mm-hmm. A day late. (laughs) You know, I probably lost that uh, chorus job. (laughs) Have any idea what you'll do then? Oh, I think so. I have an idea. Uh, Yeah. So have I. A very good idea. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Today, we have presented transcribed Orient Express by Graham Greene, adapted for radio by Sheldon Stark and Walter Newman, with editorial supervision by John Dunkel. Starred as Gregory Myatt was Bill Conrad. Featured players were Edgar Barrier, Hans Conrad, Gloria Grant, Harry Bartell, Anne Morrison, Jack Crucian, and John Daner. The special music was arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week... You are alone in the steaming jungle with three men. You know that one of them is a desperate criminal, a man you've come here to arrest. But you don't know which one. You'll have to find him before he can save himself by killing you. Next week... We escape with L.G. Blockman's exciting tale of a manhunt, Red Wine. Goodbye, then, until this same time next week, when once again CBS offers you Escape. Looking for more escape drama? There'll be more coming along on CBS tonight when most of these same CBS stations will bring you The Adventures of Philip Marlowe and Gangbusters. They're both regular Saturday night features on CBS. Now, stay tuned for five minutes of the latest news to be followed immediately by the Let's Pretend program over most of these same CBS network stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>